to mute everybody. Uh, yes. Okay, so uh, I actually have. Uh, okay, I have some trouble with my iPad. Uh, it's not uh, connecting. So one second. Um, I don't know why this is not. So let me share and I'll, I'll stop sharing and I'll share again. One second. Um, Good. Okay, so uh, I guess we can start now. So uh, thank you uh, for coming back to this uh, um, uh, to this session on optimization for data science. Um, so again, as I mentioned yesterday, I uh, I put the notes, I um, mean the slides, the annotated slides online on this web page that you can see here. Um, so um, so I did put the, the slides of yesterday. Uh, and I also, by the way, I, um, I uh, before I put it online, I corrected some uh, small kind of mistakes when I uh, when I was writing. In particular, when I wrote weak duality, there is some uh, kind of the, the, the proof wasn't quite complete, and also I fixed a sign mistake somewhere else. Okay, I mean some small mistakes I fixed uh, when uploading it. So um, okay, so today uh, what I would like to talk about. Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, uh, yes. okay. So what I would like to talk about is uh, what I would call structured uh, problems. Uh, so these are uh, problems that have a certain uh, particular optimization problems that have a, part in, sort, a particular structure uh, for which we have very good algorithms. I will talk about the algorithms uh, this afternoon and which have a very uh, a great uh, modeling power. Okay, we will see that all, I mean, uh, all the uh, uh, problems that we have seen, like lasso and uh, total variation denoising, and also this model predictive control, the community detection, all the kind of concrete problems I talked about during this uh, uh, during these lectures actually do fit into these uh, uh, particular structural problems. Okay, um, so uh, so let's see uh, what I mean by this. So. Uh, so we have seen, uh, as I said, we have seen uh, various optimization algorithms and analyzed their convergence rate. So uh, we've seen the gradient method, the fast gradient method, uh, the proximal gradient method, uh, subgradient ADM. I mean, we've seen a bunch of, of such algorithms. And these are all usually very simple algorithms. So usually it just takes one line when I write it in, uh, I mean, on my slide, if you implement it in, in MATLAB or Python, that would take just a few lines. Okay, it takes really five to 10 minutes to implement. Uh, but they're very simple uh, and they, they can also be sometimes very fast, very efficient. Uh, the drawback, however, is that they're not very flexible. Okay, so uh, they only, they are adapted to particular uh, problems with a certain structure. Okay, and if you want to uh, do a small change in the, objective, in the objective function, or if you want to add a new constraint and so on, you have to rethink completely the algorithm and uh, probably actually change the algorithm or, or even just rewrite it. I mean, if you change the objective function a little bit, you have to recompute the gradient, re-implement it, and so on, uh, hard coded and so on. Uh, and so this takes a little bit of time. And uh, when you are in a phase where you try to find what is the right objective function for your problem, what is the right constraint you have to put, and so on, uh, this can be um, uh, a bit annoying, OK? So think, for example, of uh, this uh, when when so we 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 designed this algorithm to solve the lasso problem, uh, which is the problem of minimizing a quadratic cost plus an L1 norm of x. And as soon as we wanted to change the L1 norm of x to just the L1 norm of d times x, but we wanted to put a linear operator here, uh, the proximal gradient method did not work anymore. So we had to think about uh, duality and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, so what I would like to talk about today is a, is a, <clears throat> a class of uh, structural problems that uh, have a great modeling power and that allow that will encompass all the lasso and, and regularization things that that, um, that we mentioned. 
okay, and for which we have uh, very uh, efficient algorithms and people have already implemented this, this thing so you can uh, reuse them uh, very easily. Okay, so the, the, the challenge on your side is then to do the modeling, to understand that your problem can actually be written either as a linear program or as a quadratic program or as a semi-definite program. So today we'll really be focused on these three classes of problems, L linear programming, short for LP, QP for quadratic programming, and SDP for semi-definite programming. Okay. Uh, okay, so let me jump uh, right in the right in the subject. So what is linear programming? So uh, a linear program is uh, uh, the problem of, so of minimizing a uh, linear function, so C transpose X, subject to some linear inequality constraints. Okay, so subject to AX is less than B. So here the variable I'm optimizing over is X. Okay, that's a vector in RN. And the problem is completely specified by uh, the vector C, the cost uh, vector, uh, a matrix A uh, of size M by N. So here typically M will be bigger than N and a right-hand side B, uh, a vector in RM as well. Okay, so it's really just given by a matrix and two vectors. Okay, and that's what essentially an LP algorithm, an LP solver, that's exactly what it will do. It, it will take as input A, B, C, and it will output the solution of this optimization problem. Okay, here the uh, inequality AX less than B is interpreted component-wise. So this means that the ith component of the vector AX is less than the ith component of the vector B. Okay, AX uh, I is less than BI for all I between one and M. Uh, as I will explain in the next slides to come, uh, uh, I mean, this may look a little bit uh, dry, I mean, such linear programs, but in fact, we'll see that many problems in signal and image processing can be expressed as linear programs. Okay, so there's, there's a certain choice of A, B, and C uh, that will uh, correspond to, uh, to the problem that, that we have. For example, problems involving total variation regularization, problems involving the L1 norm and so on can be very easily put into linear programming form. And I will explain how to do this. Uh, okay, linear programming is probably uh, uh, the oldest topic in the area of mathematical optimization, so it dates back to the 1940s. It started in the Second World War to solve some problems in operations research. Uh, um, so famous names associated to linear programming are Dansish and Kantorovich. Uh, and so it has a very, uh, uh, I mean, old history, if you want. And so, uh, uh, and so that's why we have also very uh, sophisticated and mature algorithms to solve linear programs. Okay. So there are many, uh, uh, I, I mean, there are many uh, implementations of, of uh, linear programming algorithms available. Some of them free, some of them are not free, but overall they're all uh, very efficient. Uh, and so here I've just put some a list of some of the most well-known uh, implementations. I mean, GLPK, Soplex are, are free, uh, are open source, so anyone can download the news and see the source. Uh, Cplex, Gurobi, and Mosaic are, are closed source. So these are commercial solvers. So you have to pay for them. Some of them have academic licenses and so on. I'll talk a bit more about software later on. Okay. So uh, before I explain why linear programming uh, matters for data science, uh, I mean, how can it be applied to these problems like Lasso and so on? Let me first just have a quick look at the geometry of linear programming. Let's try to understand what is happening, the problem of minimizing a linear function on, uh, on a set of linear inequalities. Okay. So, um, uh, okay, so let's, uh, let's uh, try to uh, draw here. So I have, I want to minimize C transpose X. Okay, subject to, I can write my constraints as AI transpose X less than BI for all I between one and M. Okay, and here what I just did is that I wrote uh, my matrix A, A, A1 transpose is the first row, okay, up to AM transpose, this is the last row. Okay, and each AI is a vector in RN. Okay, so you can see here that each, I have M linear inequalities, so M scalar linear inequalities. So obviously uh, each one defines a half space. So if you remember the very first lecture, each one will define a half space. So, so for example, um, uh, let's see. So if I if I draw 
this is this is a1 transpose x is equal to b1. So this is a hyperplane. Okay. Then a1 transpose x less than b1 is every is, is everything on this side of the hyperplane. Okay. So here I have a bunch of such linear inequalities. So I have now this is maybe a2. Okay. Uh, so I have to look at this side of the hyperplane. And then this is a3, a4, a5, maybe a6. Okay, so uh, this is like a3, a4, a5, and a6. Okay, and so uh, really my feasible set uh, is given by, uh, is, is, is actually what we call a polyhedron. Okay, it is really this set that you can see here. Okay, so inside here, this is the feasible set of the linear program. Okay, feasible set of the linear program. Okay, so everything inside this set, all X's that live inside this set are feasible and everything outside is infeasible. Okay. So now, uh, so now let's look at the objective function. So I would like to minimize uh, C transpose X. Okay, so, uh, okay, so you can think of C as, as a vector. So a vector, let, let's assume that uh, it points, uh, let's say, I don't know, in this way. Okay, well, let, me, let me just make it, um, uh, uh, like this. Okay, so let's assume that C points in this way. Okay, so if you want to mi minimize C transpose X, you want to go as far as possible in the opposite direction of C. Okay, so uh, so for, uh, just to make sure, I mean, the, what are the, the level sets of C? What are the sets where C transpose X is a constant? So these are hyperplanes whose normal vector is C. So this is, so this, I mean, this set, for example, could correspond to C transpose X is equal to 10, for example. Okay, this set could correspond to C transpose X is equal to nine and so on and so forth. Okay, so if you want to go as far as possible in the opposite direction of C, you can see that the optimal point is really going to be in here. Okay, so this is my optimal point X star. Okay, and the value, okay, will be just C transpose X star. Okay, so here C transpose X is equal to C transpose X star. This is the hyperplane uh, on which X star uh, lies in. Okay, so, so you can see that um, the optimal point, I mean, it is clear from this simple geometric picture that the optimal point um, uh, lies on what we call an extreme point of uh, an extreme point of the polyhedron. So by the way, I should say that this feasible set of a linear program is called a polyhedron. Okay, it is an intersection of a finite number of half spaces. Okay, uh, so or, or if you want another way of saying it, it's a, it's a set defined by a finite number of linear inequalities. Okay, and uh, any polyhedron have a certain number of extreme points. Okay, so these are uh, uh, the intersections of, uh, let's say if your polyhedron lives in dimension N, which is our case here, so here it's dimension two, then it's an intersection of n uh, linear inequalities. So here I'm in dimension two. So the extreme points are given by intersections of two hyperplanes or two lines just in this case. Okay, so uh, the extreme points are really uh, this X star that you can see here, but the other extreme points is this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. Okay, so we know it's a basic geometric fact in linear programming that the optimal solution can always be found in the set of extreme points of the polyhedron. Okay, so um, uh, so so this is something uh, that is well known, and in fact, this is something that is exploited algorithmically. Uh, the simplex method to solve linear programming is exactly based on this fact. So it uh, starts at a certain extreme point, and then it keeps moving, okay, in a certain way, uh, in order to reach the optimal, the best extreme point. Uh, and, and this is actually one of the, this is the first algorithm that was invented to solve linear programming. And it's, it's invented by Danzig again in the 1940s. 
and uh, more there are more modern algorithms. I mean, simplex methods are still very uh, competitive uh, until now, uh, are among the best algorithms. Uh, there is uh, more recently in the 1990s, uh, uh, people develop new algorithms that that are kind of on par uh, with with simplex methods. And these are so-called path following methods. So they have a much more continuous nature to them. And they're based on Newton's method, an iterative application of Newton's method. And this is what I will try to explain um, uh, this afternoon. I will try to explain how these path following methods uh, work. Uh, and I, I will not really discuss the simplex method. OK. Um, so okay, so this is just to kind of have a a, a brief overview of uh, of uh, the geometry of linear programming. When I talk about path following methods, we'll revisit a little bit this picture of a polyhedron, and and we will see how the interior point methods actually goes through. I mean, through the interior of the polyhedron, it starts from the middle of the polyhedron, and it draws a path until it reaches x star. Uh, unlike the uh, simplex method, which actually just moves on the boundary of the polyhedron and jumps from one extreme point to another. Okay, so um, so now that I've given just a brief overview of the geometry of linear programming, let me now uh, talk a bit about the modeling power of linear programming. What can you do? Uh, I mean, in, uh, what can you? What problems can you solve using linear programming? And particularly, I'll be interested in problems in, uh, I mean, things like regression problems, data fitting, and so on, which are very common in data science. Okay, so, so th this is an optimization problem that we looked at when we, uh, uh, um, when we considered the subgradient method. Okay, so uh, this is a non smooth optimization problem. I want to minimize the L1 norm of AX minus B. So it's a, it's a fitting problem. So I have uh, uh, A and B are given, and I want to find X such that uh, AX is roughly equal to B, but uh, the, 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 uh, the way I measure closeness. Uh, of AX to B is via the L1 norm instead of the uh, more usual L2 norm. Okay, so we've seen how to apply the subgradient method to this to this uh, problem. So the uh, a subgradient is given by A transpose the sine of AX minus B, and then you choose a step size that decreases and so on. So, and and I I, I show the plot and we get relatively slow convergence. Okay, so. Um, one can think about other methods. Can we kind of uh, use duality and use uh, uh, like a fast projected gradient method like we did yesterday um, uh, for the problem? So you can introduce a new variable y, call y is equal to x minus b, and then take the dual and so on. So I did this for you. And this is the dual that you get is, is written on the right-hand side. OK, so unfortunately, the dual has no is not easily amenable to uh, these projected gradient methods like, like uh, the problem of yesterday. The reason is because um, we not only have, so we have this a ball constraint just like uh, the problem of yesterday. Okay, uh, we have this and we know how to project very well on this. But the addition of this affine constraint of this actually linear constraint in this case, uh, makes, the, makes it uh, harder to project on. Okay, so even though I know I can easily project on uh, the cube, this uh, set of norm, uh, the set of Z such that the infinity norm of Z is less than one. I know how to easily project on this. I also know how to easily project on a linear space, okay? On a linear subspace, but the intersection, the, the projecting on the intersection is not easy in general, okay? So there is no closed form expression for this one. Okay, so this doesn't, doesn't quite work, okay? So, um, so what you can do, okay, so I, yesterday, very briefly, I talked about ADMM and I, I said it's, a, a, it's also a dual, a method based on duality on, on the augmented Lagrangian. Uh, in this case, actually, it turns out to be, uh, you, you can do it. So, uh, and it turns out to have a simple expression. So uh, if you write the augmented Lagrangian, like I showed uh, at the end of yesterday's lecture, uh, and you write down the iterations of, of ADMM, you can see that the iteration on, on X is going to be a least squares problem. So that corresponds to uh, uh, really uh, inverting a matrix, solving a linear system. Uh, you can show that uh, the, the step on YK plus one, so this uh, partial minimization on Y, uh, if you look at the expression of, of the augmented Lagrangian, so I have a, an L1 norm, okay? And I have an L2 norm here, okay? That only involves Y. 
okay, and there is no linear operator on Y, and so and there is a linear term as well. So uh, this is actually going to decompose along the components of Y. Each component of Y will be independent, so it's a decomposable problem. And um, there is a closed form solution for each component of Y. And in fact, it will be some kind of soft threshold because you have an L1, you have an absolute value of YI and you have a, a YI squared as well that will appear. Okay. So the X term, the partial minimization on X will be easy. The partial minimization on Y will be easy. And then the, the update of Z, as I mentioned, it's a gradient update. So it's just, you look at the gradient of, uh, of L with respect to Z. So uh, this, is, this is really uh, what you do. Uh, okay, and so it's also a simple update. So in general, ADMM is, is simple, so you can implement it very easily. Again, it will take just a few lines in MATLAB or Python, and it will run. And I okay, I didn't try it, but I expect it will be faster than the subgradient method. Um, okay, so this is this is very nice. But then now, uh, okay, we've gone through this kind of this process of trying to find an algorithm for this problem. But now, what if I kind of I go back to my uh, the Kind of the motivation or, or the, um, um, I mean, uh, I, so I essentially I solved this and then I'm not very happy with the solution. So I say that maybe I need actually to add some kind of uh, a regularization term. Okay, so I need to add, uh, I don't, I mean, I mean uh, a term like an infinity norm of some D times X where D is some operator, maybe a finite difference operator or whatever. Okay, so then I have to go through the process of rethinking my algorithm completely. So maybe now, uh, maybe now the ADMM will not work, and I will have to find another uh, kind of uh, another another approach. Okay, and this is what I was mentioning in the beginning: is that uh, these methods are are very nice when you know for sure this is the optimization problem you want to solve. But if you want a little bit of flexibility, if you're still looking for the right objective function and the right constraint uh, that you're trying to put to uh, to have a meaningful solution then these, these algorithms are not very flexible. They kind of are, are, are tailored to very particular structures and they're a bit brittle, okay? So, um, so now this is where kind of, I think the power of uh, uh, linear programming and, and quadratic programming is, is that uh, they're extremely flexible. You, uh, such a problem, so norm of EX minus B uh, and then uh, enters into the framework of linear programming. If you want to add some regularization, it's very easy. If you want to remove the D or add a new operator and so on, it's also, uh, it just enters naturally without any, without any difficulty. So let me, let me explain this. Um, let me try to work out the details of how, uh, why this is the case. So, so, okay, so this is the claim is that uh, this problem of minimizing the L1 norm of AX minus B uh, is equal to this problem on the right hand side. So you see that this problem on the right hand side have new variables called S, okay? And this is the transformation that I did in order to put it into a linear programming form. So obviously the left hand side as written is not a linear program because I have an L1 norm in my objective function and in a linear program, the, uh, the objective function has to be linear. Um, Okay, and this is exactly what the transformation, what the addition of this new variable S uh, is doing, is it rewrites, reformulates the problem in a certain way, uh, in such a way that now the objective function is linear, and uh, I am now adding new constraints, but the constraints are all uh, are all linear inequalities as well. Okay, so let me prove uh, this equivalence between the two optimization problems. It's it's actually not uh, not difficult. Okay, so really what you um, um, what, what these new variables, uh, these variables really play the role of the absolute values of AX minus B, okay, of the components of AX minus B. Okay, so I just want to point out here, and, and, and I hope this is kind of more or less obvious, is that now this is a linear program. I did not say it explicitly, so let me let me write it down explicitly at least. So here I have a linear objective function, okay, and I have linear inequalities, okay. So it fits the linear programming uh, model that I mentioned. So okay, so let me prove uh, the equivalence. So uh, now, uh, uh, how do we prove equivalence? So observe that for any x uh, in R n. Okay, if you take um, if you take s to be the vector, the absolute value 
of ax minus b. So this is component-wise absolute value. So this means more precisely that si is the absolute value of ax minus b i. Okay. Uh, then xs is feasible for the LP. Okay, because obviously what I have is that AX minus B is less, again, everything you should think of it component-wise is less than absolute value of AX minus B and minus absolute value of AX minus B. Okay, any number, any real number is, is always contained between uh, its absolute value and the negative of its absolute value. Uh, okay, and so this means then, and then for, for this choice of S, the sum of SI, is equal to the sum of the absolute value of ax minus b. Okay, and this is just the L1 norm of ax minus b. Okay, so this shows then that uh, this this shows that the value of the LP okay is at most the minimum. of ax minus b. Okay, remember which is the problem I'm interested in. Okay, because you, uh, I mean, for you, you give me the optimal x, for example, you give me the optimal x here, and I, I choose the s, which is absolute value of ax minus b. And I showed, uh, what I have shown is I've constructed a feasible point for the linear program that attains the same, uh, the same value as, uh, that attains essentially norm of ax star minus b one. Uh, okay, so this shows uh, if you want one direction of the uh, of the equality. Um, okay, the other direction is, is is very easy as well. Okay, so um, um, so now uh, take any so for any now for any feasible point. X S of the LP. I call this linear program, I call it LP. Okay, so I have AX minus B is contained between minus S and S. Okay, so this implies, okay, that, uh, that S is bigger component-wise than the absolute value of AX minus B. Okay? Okay, if you have a number S that is, uh, um, uh, I mean, I mean, if you have x that is contained between s and minus s, then s has to be bigger than the absolute value of x. Uh, okay, this is kind of uh, trivial to, to see. Okay, so s is component-wise bigger than uh, absolute value of x minus b, and so this means that the sum of the s size is bigger than uh, the L1 norm of x minus b. Okay. Uh, and so this essentially shows, so when you minimize over X and S, okay, this shows then that the value of the LP, so this implies, okay, I don't have much space here, but this implies that uh, LP value is bigger than the minimum of AX minus B. Okay, so essentially what we have shown is, uh, I've shown the two inequalities so this have shown that the, the two problems are really uh, are really equivalent. Okay, so you can formulate the uh, this L1 regression or this L1 fitting problem as a linear program. And I mentioned that, uh, and I will talk a bit more about this, that we have uh, very good algorithms and very good software to solve linear programs. So you can just uh, use any of these algorithms, uh, any of these existing solvers to solve, to solve your problem. Okay, what is important here is, uh, to be to understand that this problem can be modeled as a linear program. Okay, so so let's now uh, go through uh, what I mean. What I mentioned in the in the previous slide. So what if now I okay I solve this optimization problem and then I'm not very happy with the solution and I I uh, I decide I want to add a certain regularization. Okay, and I decide that I want to add a certain uh, regularization with an infinity norm. So lambda times the infinity norm of d times x. Okay, 
Now I claim that this is also a linear program, okay? And it's a very simple uh, modification to, uh, or addition to the linear program from the previous slide, okay? The idea is that, is just to note that, um, that the norm, so the norm of dx, the infinity norm of dx is less than t, okay? So this is if and only if the absolute value of dx is less than t for all i, between one and M, let's say if D has M rows. Okay, but then again, I'm going to use the fact that the absolute value is less than T if and only if the number itself is between minus T and T. Okay, so this is if and only if minus T is less than DX I is less than T for all I between one and M. Okay, and I rewrite this in a, in a kind of uh, component wise vector way as writing that dx is less than t times, okay, where one, okay, is just the vector of all ones, okay? So really uh, this component, this, uh, sorry, this constraint that I have in here in red, This co constraint is really equivalent to norm of dx infinity is less than t. Okay. And then, okay, so I forgot, I guess I forgot the, the lambda here. I should have written a lambda. Uh, but you can see that then, uh, you can see that adding this new regularization term, lambda times the infinity norm of dx, uh, just is a simple modification to. Uh, to the original uh, linear program, okay? So, and, and for that reason, I mentioned that this is uh, quite a flexible um, uh, modeling system, if you want. So uh, uh, what you just have to know are these rules, these ways to uh, transform these L1 norms and infinity norms and other, uh, and, and, and other functions into an LP equivalent uh, formulation, okay? And there are just a bunch of tricks that one should know and, 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 and um, that one learns by experience, um, and 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 once you once you have this, then you you kind of you can model your problem in, in uh, using these linear problems. Um, okay, so so uh, yeah, so you can do. I mean, let's say if if you wanted to do a regression with infinity norm. So obviously, I, I will not write this again. This is uh, exactly what I just mentioned. So this uh, this guy. This is equivalent to AX minus B, infinity is less than T, okay? Um, uh, okay, and so, yeah, so that's, that's yet another, uh, another problem that's uh, kind of uh, a variant of Lasso. So, so remember that, um, so remember that the Lasso problem was to minimize one half of norm of AX minus B squared plus lambda times the L1 norm of X. Okay. So here, uh, the typically the setting in Lasso is that we have, uh, is that A is a, is a rectangular matrix that looks like this. Okay. So this is an overdetermined system. So AX minus B, AX is equal to B is an overdetermined system. So you have many solutions of AX is equal to B. And, uh, uh, kind of a variant of Lasso that has appeared uh, quite a lot, especially in the area of compressed sensing and signal processing is actually the problem of minimizing uh, over X in RN uh, of the L1 norm of X subject to AX is equal to B. Okay, so you want to find among all possible solutions to AX is equal to B. I mean, there's a whole subspace of solutions. You want to find the one of minimum L1 norm. So this is not, I mean, this is uh, related directly to the Lasso problem. Uh, it is uh, exactly the Lasso problem where we require the L2 uh, squared norm, uh, the L2 squared norm term to actually be equal to zero. Okay, so you, you put, um, uh, you want it to be zero. So you just want AX is equal to B and you want to minimize the L1 norm of, of X. Okay, so uh, this is this last one is was kind of popular in, in compressed sensing the, for the problem of uh, determining sparse solutions to a linear system, and okay, using similar tricks as I uh, as I mentioned before, you can rewrite this problem by adding by uh, including this uh, slag variable, okay, so uh, and and by adding these linear inequality constraints, okay, 
this is uh, equivalent to the absolute value of x is less than s component wise. Okay, and then you, you sum uh, the si, and this will give you the L1 norm of x. Okay, here this is a linear problem. Okay. Uh, yeah, obviously, if you want to find the, 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 a solution to a linear system with minimum infinity norm, then the same, you can also form, uh, frame this as a, as, a, as, a, um, as a linear program as well. Okay. So, um, okay, so I, uh, I mean, um, to talk about a linear program, I should talk a little bit about, about duality of a linear program because this is kind of a, an important component of, of uh, the theory of linear programming. So let me uh, uh, briefly talk about this, about what is the dual of a linear program. It will happen to be another, uh, um, uh, another linear program. And it's important to understand, to have a, a basic understanding of duality of linear programming, because this is also affects how uh, you interact. If you use a solver, a linear programming solver, then you will have to uh, uh, kind of be familiar a bit with, with duality, okay? So, um, uh, and for a reason that I will explain uh, in the next slide. Okay, so if you, so if the program is, you want to minimize C transpose X subject to AX is less than B. Okay, uh, I would like to uh, write the Lagrangian dual and the dual problem in, in the sense that I defined uh, yesterday. So, because yesterday I only dealt with uh, problems with linear equalities. So I'm going to rewrite this problem in a slightly different way with just uh, linear equalities. So I'm going to uh, observe the very simple observation that this is equal to the minimum over all x in Rn and s in Rm, okay, of C transpose x uh, plus I'm going to uh, uh, add an indicator function which I'm going to explain now. Uh, this subject to S is equal to B minus AX, okay? And where, where uh, I plus of S, this is the indicator function, which is equal to zero if S is a vector that is uh, non-negative, component-wise non-negative, and it is plus infinity elsewhere. Okay, so obviously uh, what I'm just doing, this is kind of a mathematical trick, you could call it. Okay, so I'm, I'm just defining S to be the slack, uh, the vector of slack, so B minus AX. So obviously my, my linear program is defined by the vector of slack has to be non-negative. So B minus AX has to be non-negative. So I kind of put this in the objective function. And uh, another way of saying this is that I'm uh, restricting my objective function C transpose X. Uh, which I think of it as a, as a function of X and S, even though it doesn't explicitly depend on S, as I'm restricting its domain to be the domain, the set of S such that S is non-negative. This is just one way of, of writing it. So I'm adding the indicator function of, of this set. Okay, so now I have a problem. So now I could call, uh, this is my uh, F of X. Okay, it's a convex function. And this is, I have a linear equality constraint. This is a linear equality constraint. Okay, so I can I can define the Lagrangian dual as I as I did yesterday. So the Lagrangian, okay, so L of uh, x s. So these are the primal variables, uh, and z. This is going to be my dual variable. So this is C transpose x plus the indicator function of s, okay, plus z transpose. S minus uh, B plus AX. Okay, so let me collect the terms. I'll, I'm, I'll, I will need to minimize this over, over X and S. So let me collect together the terms in X and the terms in S. So I have, this is C uh, plus A transpose Z transpose X. Okay, so the A transpose, I have an X in here, which is, uh, so I have A transpose Z Transpose, uh, transpose X. And then I have plus uh, Z transpose S plus I plus of S. And then I have a minus B transpose Z. 
Okay, so you can see that the, uh, the Lagrangian decomposes. I have something that depends only on X, something that depends only on, on, on S, and then I have a constant term. So, um, so then this means that my, uh, my, uh, my dual function, so G of Z, remember, it's defined as the max over all X and S of L of X, S, Z. Okay, so I can then write it as uh, the max over X of C plus A transpose Z transpose X. Uh, okay, and uh, so sorry, this is the mean. Why did I write the max? The, the, full, the final problem will be a max. Um, so this is the mean of C plus A transpose Z uh, transpose X. And then um, okay, let me write a bit. Uh, I have some space, so this is okay. Plus the mean over S of Z transpose S plus I plus of S. Okay, minus B transpose. Z. Okay, so I have to solve individually these two uh, problems, the one on X and the one on S. So uh, uh now let's let's do this this is very simple so the mean over x of c plus a transpose z uh, transpose x so this is a minimizing uh, a linear function uh on the whole space so obviously this linear i mean there are two cases either the vector c plus a transpose z is equal to zero in which case the linear function is, is equal to zero everywhere okay and the minimum is equal to zero Otherwise, if the vector is not zero, then obviously the minimum is going to be equal to minus infinity. Okay, if I uh, I can just uh, drive it down to minus infinity, so this is equal to zero if c plus a transpose z is equal to zero and is equal to minus infinity s. Okay, and then uh, I want to minimize. Now I I look at the term in s, so I want to minimize z transpose s plus i plus of s. Okay, so this is equivalent. You see that this is the same as minimizing z transpose s, uh, just subject to s is not negative. Okay, this is the effect of just adding the indicator function. And again, this is very easy to, uh, to solve. So this is equal to zero if z itself is a non-negative vector. And if z has a single component that, is, that has a negative component, uh, has a single component which is negative, then by taking S very large uh, in this component, then you can make uh, Z transpose S as small as, as you want. And so you can drive this down to minus infinity. Okay, so if, if Z has a negative. Okay, and so uh, what this actually means then is, uh, is that I, the domain of my uh, the domain of my um, of my dual function g of z is going to be defined by uh, c plus a transpose z is equal to zero and z non negative and the value on this domain will be equal to minus b transpose z. Okay, so so the uh, okay here so I've, I've written it down for you. So uh, this was the original uh, primal optimization problem I dealt with. So minimize C transpose X on C transpose X on AX less than B. And uh, the dual is uh, what I just derived is the maximization of minus B transpose Z subject to Z non negative and A transpose Z plus Z plus C is equal to Z. A transpose Z plus C is equal to Z. So you can see that the dual is also a linear program. So uh, it's a here is a maximization of a linear function subject to some linear inequalities and linear equality constraints. It's, it's, a, it's a linear program as well. Uh, strong duality, if you apply Slater's condition, uh, strong duality will hold if uh, the set of, um, if these linear inequalities AX less than B have a strict, strictly feasible solution. So this means if you can find an X such that AX is strictly less than B, okay? Uh, in fact, it turns out that the, for, for the special case of linear programming, you really do not need the strict feasibility. If you just have feasibility, that's enough. And you will have strong duality, even though I, okay, we did not, I, that's, a, that's a special property of linear programming. And uh, now uh, the, the important point that I want to kind of emphasize is that to prove that X is the global optimal solution of your linear programming, 
uh, what it suffices to have is to have what we call a certificate. So is to have a dual feasible solution. Okay, so this is, uh, is to have a Z. So this is dual feasibility. Is to have a Z that is dual feasible and that has the same optimal value as um, a C transpose X. Okay, this is exactly the picture I mentioned last time. So you have the value of the LP. So if I call this guy LP here, okay, so I have LP and you, you give me an X, okay? This, the, the C transpose X will be in here and you give me a Z. I know that uh, minus B transpose Z is going to be below it. Okay, this is, we said this is by weak duality. I'm, uh, I mean, the, the primal problem I'm minimizing, the dual problem I'm maximizing and both of them will reach the same optimal value. But if you claim, if you say that I, I found an X and a Z such that C transpose X is equal to minus B transpose Z, then the only possibility is in fact that C transpose X is equal to minus B transpose Z is equal to LP, is equal to the value of the LP and that's the global solution. Okay, so this is a very nice uh, thing about linear programming and convex optimization in general is that, uh, is that you can actually have certificates of global optimality. Uh, and this is something that solvers do exploit. So when a solver gives you a solution X to the linear program, it will also typically return for you a, a, a Z that, it, that certifies that the X uh, that it gives you is indeed the global optimum. So it will give you a Z and then you can independently uh, check that Z is not negative, A transpose Z plus C is equal to zero and C transpose X is equal to minus B transpose Z. Okay. Uh, so this means that you don't really have to trust uh, the algorithm or anything. You, I mean, if you if the algorithm just returns for you this z, it can do whatever it wants in the algorithm. And if if it just gives you this z and and this x and they satisfy these three conditions, then you know for sure that you are at the optimal point. Okay. Um, okay. And I mentioned most LP solvers uh, will provide such a certificate z for you. Okay, so um, okay, so this is uh, this is for uh, linear programming. So we've talked a lot about linear programming. So so let me now. Uh, so linear programming has a, a good modeling power, but still it does not allow us to do. Uh, I mean, these Lasso problems when you have quadratic uh, terms in the objective, and so this is exactly what quadratic programs uh, allow you to do. So it's uh, it's similar to quadratic uh, to to linear programming, but now uh, you also have. Um, you can have quadratic terms in the objective function and you can have quadratic inequalities. Okay, so this is a, a quadratic, uh, and this is a quadratic uh, uh, constraint. And uh, uh, you, you, we do require, however, that Q and the FI, they must be positive semi-definite so that the problem is convex. Okay, so the uh, now the problem is given by uh, a lot more, um, uh, parameters. So even though for linear programming, we just had uh, A, B, and C. So now we have just, I mean, you have to specify what the matrices of the, of the uh, quadratic, uh, of the quadratic objective is and, and, and of the quadratic um, uh, uh, constraints are. Uh, okay, but, but it is, so it, it has a, a greater modeling power compared to, uh, compared to linear programming. So the geometry is different. So the the uh, the, uh, the feasible set of a quadratic program is not uh, is not a polyhedron anymore. So it's going to involve some ellipsoids. Okay, and so you have some intersections of ellipsoids with polyhedra. Okay, and the cost function that you want to minimize now is not a linear function anymore, but it's a quadratic function. Okay, so the geometry uh, is changed. So the 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 solution paradigm based on going from extreme point to another extreme point. Uh, given by the simplex method, this is not applicable anymore. And so in this case, the kind of the most, um, uh, the typical algorithm that, that people do implement is uh, uh, this interpoint methods, I mean, these path following methods, which, which are applicable to quadratic programs uh, as well. Um, okay, I mean, there are other, other methods that one can implement, but these are the, probably the, the common ones uh, uh, that, that are implemented. Okay, so let's, let's see one example. So let's look at the Lasso problem. 
uh, which had a quadratic term, uh, one half of norm of x minus b squared plus lambda uh, L1 norm of x. Uh, so this is equivalent to uh, the quadratic program. I just expand somehow just the, this whole term. And what you get is kind of uh, most obviously a quadratic term. And then the L1 norm, you do the same trick I mentioned for the linear program uh, case. You add a new variable S that will play the role of the absolute value of X. And you add a new constraint, which is a linear constraint. Okay. And now note that, uh, so th this allows you to model Lasso as a quadratic program. Now, if I want to change the regularization from the L1 norm of X to the L1 norm of DX, this does not pose any problem, okay? It's not like the proximal gradient where kind of, uh, uh, okay, the L1 norm has a simple prox, but the L1 norm of DX does not have a simple prox. Here we're completely, uh, this, the changing X to DX does not pose any problem. Things are still linear. And so they still kind of uh, 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 fit very well the model of, of quadratic programs. Um, also, you can add some additional regularizations if you want, like an L2 norm or, or whatever. In fact, uh, quadratic programs are quite, uh, uh, can model quite a, a wide range of problems. In fact, not only you can model L2 norms, but you can also model uh, any kind of LP norms. Okay, so uh, L4 norms and so on. Uh, and, and this is kind of not so trivial, but, but this is something that, you, that one can do. Um, Okay, so uh, so let's see. So, yeah, so in the in the very first session, I talked about a problem in controls in, in model predictive control, and uh, this very naturally fits a quadratic program. So uh, the the problem was I have a certain dynamical system x t plus one is equal to a x t plus b u t. So here I'm assuming it's linear. This is important, and I wanted to choose the control inputs the u's in such a way that I follow a certain reference trajectory. And so here you can see that my cost function, my objective function is, is all quadratic and it's all positive definite, assuming that R is positive definite. And the constraints I have are simple linear constraints or simple infinity norm constraints, which can all be modeled uh, in the, uh, um, I mean, using linear inequalities essentially. So, so again, this enters into the quadratic programming framework. Um, uh, okay, so this is for model predictive control. Uh, so maybe let me finish with by talking about yet an, uh, an, um, an even wider class of problems for which we have a good algorithm. So this is uh, well, semi-different programming is a bit more uh, advanced. So I, I will just kind of mention one application and, and um, uh, uh, because this is, I mean, I would say this is, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the research in semi-definite programming uh, is most active, I mean, uh, since the uh, maybe 1990s, 2000s and so on. So it's much newer than quadratic programs and, and, uh, and linear programming, but it has seen recently quite a lot of applications. So let me uh, mention it. So uh, it doesn't sound very intuitive, but in fact, it has a very strong modeling power. And I'll try to explain why this is the case. So in a semi in a semi-definite program, uh, what you want to do is to, uh, the, the optimization variable is a matrix, not a vector anymore. So it's a matrix that's, that's symmetric. And the constraint that you put on this matrix is that it has to be a positive semi-definite. Okay, so this is positive semi-definite. Okay, so i.e. all eigenvalues are non-negative. Okay, not the components. The eigenvalues of X have to be non-negative. Okay, so the constraint is you want the eigenvalues of X to be non-negative. You have some additional, uh, you have some additional linear constraint on X. Okay, and you want to minimize a, a linear function of X. So this is really, this is just the sum of Cij, Xij. Okay, so it's just given by C, A, and B. So C is a symmetric matrix. A is a certain linear map from symmetric matrices to a vector uh, RM, and B is a right-hand side in RM. Okay, it turns out that linear programming and quadratic programming are a special case of semi-definite programming. It doesn't seem uh, obvious at all from the way I presented it, but uh, you can. this is something that you can show. Maybe I, I will show it quickly in the next slide. I mean, at least I will just explain the key lemmas or the key results that you need to do this. 
And the reason why SEMA different programming, one reason why SEMA different programming has been quite popular recently is that uh, uh, if you think about a combinatorial optimization problem, uh, something like the a community detection problem that I mentioned of, of trying to cluster uh, uh, nodes in a graph and so on. So, so uh, this clustering or this community detection problem naturally lead to combinatorial uh, optimization problems, which are often very hard to solve. Uh, and so if you, one can formulate the Lagrangian relaxation as I explained last time, and it turns out that the Lagrangian relaxation in many cases happens to be a semi-definite program. So maybe what I will do just to motivate a bit uh, semi-definite programming, because it seems, uh, again, this, uh, this optimization doesn't seem very uh, obvious. To, to motivate the definition, I will derive this Lagrangian relaxation for the community detection problem. And I will show that it fits the semi-definite programming framework. Uh, OK, and uh, yeah, so wh why do we actually consider such problems is because we, ha we also do have efficient algorithms based on the theory of path following methods to solve them, to solve them efficiently. Um, okay, so, so why are linear programming and quadratic programs are a, a special case of, of uh, semi-definite programming? So you, you see that if, if, uh, so if X is diagonal, if X is a diagonal matrix, okay, so then, X a positive semi-definite, so this is positive semi-definite. Okay, if and only if the X size are all non-negative, that is kind of obvious. So this is non-negativity in the usual sense, it's a scalar. Okay, so by restricting my X uh, to be diagonal, okay, so I can write, if I want to write minimize C transpose X subject to AX is equal to B, AX is less than B, Okay, so I can rewrite this. Uh, obviously, this is an overkill, but it's just to kind of say that it's a special case. I can rewrite this as minimize, okay, the trace of C times X. Uh, okay, so how should I uh, write this? So in fact, let me instead just, um, okay, because this is in the dual form. So let me take instead um, a, a so this is what we call a linear program in standard form. So it's uh, it can be equivalently put in the inequality form I mentioned before by, by a simple transformation. So uh, I can rewrite this as uh, the trace of C times X subject to uh, X is uh, positive semi-definite. Uh, okay, and uh, I can put some additional constraints. So I can write here that X is diagonal, okay. And then, uh, okay, the AX is equal to B, I can rewrite it as some linear constraints on the entries of X. Okay, this is, uh, this is fairly easy. And, and so, and here C is just the diagonal of the CIs. Okay, so, I mean, essentially the idea is just to say that uh, by restricting a positive semi-definite matrix to be a diagonal matrix, you can get to just component-wise inequalities. Um, so now this is for linear programming. For quadratic programming, it's not uh, it's not so uh, obvious. And uh, what you have to do is to use kind of a certain uh, result um, about positive semi-definite matrices. So for example, you can show that if you have a constraint like an L2 norm of Y is less than C, you can rewrite this as a, a certain matrix is positive semi-definite. So for example, you can show that this is equivalent to the following block matrix. So I put a C here, Y transpose Y, and then a C identity. This is positive semi-definite. Okay, so and this equivalence is essentially due, is a, is a result that, that is used very often in semi-definite programming. It's called the sure complement lemma. So this is just to tell you that, uh, yeah, so essentially using uh, positive semi-definite uh, constraints, you can model uh, various quadratic constraints as well. Okay, but this is not, this is just kind of of theoretical interest, just to be uh, uh, sure that semi-definite programming contains LPs and quadratic programs. Uh, if your program is an LP, you should not use an SDP solver. You should really use an LP solver. And if your problem is a QP, is a quadratic program, you should use a QP solver, not an SDP solver. 
because it will exploit the special properties of, of your problem rather than treating it as a generic SDK. Um, yes, yeah, so, so to, to kind of, uh, uh, I mean, explain something a bit more uh, concrete and, and practical, let me uh, talk about this hard optimization community detection problem and let's see how one can use SDP to, um, to solve it. Uh, or, or to get a relaxation or to get an approximate solution to it. Okay, so remember the, the question from the very first session, I, I have a certain graph, so I have some nodes and I have uh, edges between these nodes. And what I would like to do is to assign uh, each node to know essentially uh, which community does each node belong to. Okay, and so how do I define a community? So a community is a, um, uh, is a set of nodes in such a way that the connections within the same community is much greater than the connections across the different communities. Okay, and I also, another uh, uh, thing that I would like is to have the two communities to have uh, similar, uh, similar size, not equal size, but approximately equal size. So, um, okay, so in this example, this is a graph with many nodes, and uh, this is an assignment of each node to a certain cluster. And uh, this is, um, uh, you can see that indeed we have edges, many edges across, uh, many edges within the same community and much fewer edges across the different communities. So much fewer edges between blue and red and much more edges between blue and blue or red and red. Okay, so how do we, how do we go about modeling uh, such a problem using optimization tools? So, um, so the usual way, I mean, the obvious way one, one would model this is to, uh, so we think about an assignment of, um, uh, an assignment of uh, nodes to communities uh, as a vector. And I will, uh, so this is a vector in plus or minus one. And essentially I write that Xi is equal to plus one. If node I is in community A, if I decide that node I is in community A, and I'm going to write minus one if node I is in community B. Okay, so now I'm interested in two, remember I have two kind of requirements in my community detection problem. I want the uh, edges within the same community, okay, to be, um, uh, to be much greater than the edges across different communities, okay? Uh, so, so how do we measure the number of edges within the same community and how do we measure the number of edges across different communities? Uh, so uh, one can write simple uh, formulas by, uh, by introducing the so-called the adjacency matrix of, of the graph. So the adjacency matrix is the matrix I would write here, Aij. So this is uh, one if I is connected to J. So if I, J, I is connected to J. Okay, and I'm going to put zero otherwise. Okay, so you put a one if you have an edge and you put a zero otherwise. So now it's a very simple calculation to show that if I form X transpose AX, where X is my vector, uh, X is this vector of plus or minus one. If I form X transpose AX, so this is going to be the summation over all the edges over all I and J that are connected by an edge of XI times XJ. So now you see that XI times XJ, this is equal to plus one. So if I and J are in the same community, okay, so let, let me write uh, here that to note that X I X J is equal to plus one if I and J, I and J are in the same community. Okay, and this is equal to minus one if I and J are in different communities. Okay, they are not in the same community. Okay, so you can see that in the in this summation that you see here, in this summation, you will have a plus one each time you have an edge between um, two nodes in the same community and you'll have a minus one each time you have an edge between uh, two different communities. Okay, so this, uh, this X transpose AX is then equal to the number of edges within the same community minus the number of edges across different communities. Okay, and uh, remembering uh, what I actually would like, so remember that uh, what I would like is that the connections within the same community is much greater than the connections across different communities. 
Okay. So what I would like to do is to is to have x transpose ax to be as large as possible. Okay. I would like the number of edges within the same community to be much larger than the number of edges across different communities. So remember what I'm trying to find here is this vector x. X is the optimization, the, the variable I'm trying to look for. And I would like x transpose the x to be as large as possible. Okay, so that the, the, the first desiderata is essentially satisfied. Okay, so the, this was for the first desiderata. What about the second one that I want the cardinality of community A and community B to be roughly of the same size? So again, I can uh, kind of uh, uh, express this in terms of the vector x. Okay, so uh, note that if I sum just the elements of xi, so I get a plus one whenever I'm in community A, a minus one whenever I'm, I'm in community B. So this is nothing but the cardinality of A minus the cardinality of B. Okay, so the sum of xi squared is a measure of how unbalanced the clustering is. Okay, so uh, uh, I mean, if uh, sum of xi is equal to zero, then it's perfectly it's perfectly balanced. I have as many nodes in A as as, as nodes in B, okay. And if it's uh, equal to one or two and so on, it's a little bit unbalanced. But I don't want to be I, I don't want the sum of xi squared to be to be very large, okay. So really, this this means that one way to solve my my clustering problem is really to maximize this x transpose ax. Okay, where a a was my uh, adjacency matrix, minus a certain lambda times the sum of x i squared. Okay, and here my x has to be in minus one plus one to the n. Okay, so this achieves a trade-off between the two uh, my two requirements that I want the edges within the same community to be uh, much greater than the edges across different communities. This is the first uh, the first requirement, and the second requirement about being balanced. Okay, so this achieves the trade-off, and lambda kind of is the measures the, this trade-off. Uh, how do I trade-off between these two requirements? Okay, so I can rewrite this in a in a simpler way. So. Uh, I mean, just in a mathematical way, so I can rewrite this as the max. Um, okay, uh, let's uh, just observe that the sum of, um, so I should not have a square in here. Uh, this is the sum of xi, the whole square. And so this is equal to, uh, so you can, you can easily see that this is equal to, um, let's see, is equal to just the, the, the vector one transpose x squared. So I can rewrite this as x transpose like e x, okay, where e is one one transpose. Okay, is the vector is the matrix of all ones. Okay, so at the end, then my optimization problem is to maximize. Um, this is to maximize over all x in minus one one to the n of x transpose a minus lambda e times x. Okay, and lambda measures the trade off how how much you want to trade off between the two requirements. Okay. Uh, so. Um, okay, this is a hard uh, quadratic. So this is a quadratic maximization problem. On the hypercube, so an x has to be in minus one one to the n. These are in general very difficult questions. They're NP hard and so on. So we don't know how to how to solve them uh, to global optimality. So uh, a popular approach that people have adopted in optimization is to form the Lagrangian relaxation. Okay, and so it turns out that if you form the Lagrangian relaxation, you get um, you get a bound on this one and uh, coming from weak duality. And it turns out that this Lagrangian relaxation is just an SDP. So this is what I will, let, let me try to derive this because it's quite simple. And I will close, this will be the last thing I will do. So, uh, so my problem then is I want to maximize uh, X transpose BX, okay, subject to XI squared is equal to one. And here I, I just use the notation that B is equal to A minus lambda. Okay, it doesn't really matter what, the, the form that is a minus lambda e in the rest of what I will do. Okay, so this is my problem. So, um, okay, so what I will do is I will uh, now form the Lagrangian. 
So by the way, the constraint xi squared is equal to one is equivalent to xi be, being um, in minus one or one. So this is just an equivalent way of writing. So this means that xi is in minus one plus one. Okay. Okay, so now my Lagrangian is L of x z is x transpose bx plus the summation of zi. So from i equals one to n of x i squared minus one. Okay, and if I want to collect the terms uh, together, so this is equal to x transpose uh, times b plus the diagonal of z uh, x minus the summation of the z. Okay, because the sum of z i x i squared, this is just the x transpose diagonal of z times x. So now, um, so now what I would like to do, so I'm going to define g of z to be, um, uh, so, okay, so actually maybe I should have, uh, just to kind of make sure that we're in the same framework as, as, I, as I did before. So let me change this into, into a minimization problem uh, just so that we don't get confused with the signs and, and I will put a negative sign in here. Okay, so maximizing something is the same as minimizing the negative of it. Okay, so now my G of Z is going to be defined as the minimum over L of X Z, okay, over all X. So now X is unconstrained. Okay, so this is now the minimum over all X of X transpose minus B plus diag of Z x minus the summation of the z. Uh, okay, and so now, now I want to solve uh, this optimization problem. I want to minimize a certain quadratic um, on the whole space. Okay, and so uh, there are two uh, cases. Okay, so this guy is going to be equal to zero if minus b plus the diagonal of z, if this is a positive semi-definite matrix, okay, if all its eigenvalues are not negative, okay, and this is going to be minus infinity else. Okay, by a very simple analysis, I mean, if you, if you minimize a quadratic uh, on the whole space, either the minimum is zero, if, the, if it's a positive semi-definite matrix, otherwise it's, it's, uh, it's minus infinity. Okay, so this means then that the dual problem Okay, is the problem of maximizing then minus the summation of the zi from i equal one to n subject to minus b plus the diagonal of z positive semi definite. Okay, this is positive semi definite. Okay, so we've seen then that. Um, now the dual uh, problem of, uh, of, uh, of this combinatorial co problem coming from community detection happens to be a semi-definite program. Uh, and uh, this coincides with the fact, remember last time I mentioned that the dual of any problem is always going to be a convex optimization problem. And this is the case in here. So the dual is a semi-definite programming problem. It's convex. Uh, it's what we call the Lagrangian relaxation. And uh, what people have observed is that very often for this community detection problem, actually the Lagrangian relaxation gives you a very good approximation of the original problem. Okay, so, um, and that's what I also showed uh, by doing a MATLAB demo uh, with you guys um, and showed how the solution of the Lagrangian relaxation uh, allows you to get a clustering. So by the way, when I, when I presented the SDP in the first session, this was not quite the SDP I showed. Okay, the SDP I showed was a different one. It happens to be, it was actually the dual of this SDP. Okay, uh, so you can take this SDP and take the dual again, you will get a minimization problem. And, and this was the SDP I showed, but, but they're actually equivalent. So I mean, they give the same optimal value and so on. Okay, so this was kind of just to motivate that semi-definite programming are being used a lot to formulate relaxations of hard co uh, combinatorial problems. Okay, so let me now just say a few words about software. So I've presented linear programming, quadratic programming, and so on, and semi-definite programming. And I said that there is a lot of software that has been developed to be able to solve such problems. 
So this isn't the case. These are some, this is a list of some of the solvers that I know of and that I kind of use or mostly use. Uh, so some of them are open source, other are, are commercial. So they're developed by, by companies and you need to pay for them. Uh, sometimes you can get academic licenses. Uh, so for example, I, I use a lot Mosaic, which is a solver which has good support for semi-definite programming. I, I, I do a lot of work in semi-definite programming. So um, uh, Groby is one of the fastest solvers. Uh, I mean, it's a commercial solver as well. Uh, you can get an academic license uh, if, you're, if you are in a university. Uh, so, so what these solvers basically do is that, let's say for linear programming, is that these solvers just take A, B, and C that specify your algorithm and will give you the solution. Now, uh, I mean, giving the A, B, and C and, and, and so is, is not kind of always very uh, user friendly. So there are certain tools that act as an interface between your solver, between the solver and you. Okay, so that will, act, so if you, if you, let's say if you choose the solver Groby, that will act as an interface between Groby and you. So what you do is that you use this interface, you write the problem as if you write it on a piece of paper, okay? And then it will do the necessary transformations to write it in a linear programming form, and then it will give it directly to the solver. So for example, uh, you know, when, when, we, when we wanted to solve the, um, when we wanted to write the Lasso problem as a quadratic program, we had to change the L1 norm. We had to introduce a new variable to, uh, that plays the role of the absolute value and add some new constraints and so on. Okay, this is exactly what the interface will do for you. So for example, this is, uh, this is one of the interfaces that I like the most is called CVX. Okay, this is for MATLAB, there is a Python version called CVX Py. But essentially in CVX for MATLAB, this is the piece of code that you write for the Lasso problem. You say, <clears throat> so you first specify what is the solver that you want to use. So here, for example, I use Mosaic. <clears throat> You write uh, the variable. Uh, the variable of your optimization problem is is uh, uh, a certain vector x that takes n components, and what you would like to do is to minimize the sum of squares of uh, the components of ax minus b. Okay, so this is uh, just norm of ax minus b squared, and this term is just lambda norm of x, lambda norm one of x. Okay, and then you just write end, and then, uh, so essentially what CVX will do, the interface, is that it will take uh, this L1 norm, okay? What it will do is that it will introduce uh, new variables, okay, S that play the role of uh, the absolute value of X, and it will add the constraint at the constraint that X has to be between S and minus S. Okay, so it will formulate, it will essentially rewrite this problem in the, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in, the, in the framework of a quadratic program as I, as I showed in the previous slides. And then it will give it to the solver. And then it, when the solver returns the solution, it will uh, kind of repackage the, uh, the solution in such a way that, that it's in the way that you have input it to the, to the, to the interface. Okay, so it's very useful. It's extremely useful for prototyping. Um, so there is a bit of overhead in this. So if, if you're looking for very high efficiency, you should not go through these interfaces. Uh, but if you just want to prototype and try out some different, uh, um, some different objective function, if you want to try to change the, the parameter lambda a little bit and see what happens to your solution, it's, it is very quick and, and, and it is very useful, I would say, for prototyping. And uh, I personally use it a lot when I, uh, uh, yes, when, when I'm kind of trying to uh, experiment in research, uh, in research stage. Okay, so I will, uh, this is the last uh, thing I wanted to say uh, in, today's, in this morning session. What I will talk about this afternoon is, uh, <clears throat> we'll talk about algorithms. We'll, we'll go back about talking about algorithms. I'll cover Newton's method, and I will explain briefly how, uh, what are the algorithms that are used to solve these linear programs, quadratic programs and semi-different programs. And these are based on something called path following methods. Okay. So this morning was a bit longer than, than usual, but uh, okay, I hope it's fine. So if you have any questions, just please, please feel free to ask. I'll look at the chat. Um, Let's 
Thank you, uh, Hamza. Uh, are there any questions? Yes. Oh, okay, someone said, what is the best subroutine function in MATLAB to solve an optimization problem? Uh, <laughs> yes, so, uh, so MATLAB has an optimization uh, toolbox uh, that has some uh, methods implemented in it. I mean, you can, if you read the documentation, you will see which kind of algorithms are implemented. So, uh, uh, yes, so it has, um, it has actually, I, I think you can even choose the algorithm that, that it, um, that it uses. So you have to be a bit careful when you actually use these MATLAB optimization toolbox, because if you just use kind of a black box without thinking, it, it, it might use some very poor algorithm. So for example, if you just give it, um, kind of a function, so a function definition, it might use a method that, um, that uh, what we call black box methods that do not actually use derivatives at all. So what we call also derivative free uh, methods. And these tend to be much worse than, uh, uh, than, than algorithms where you, have, um, where you have gradient information. Okay, so if you can if you can provide the gradient to uh, to MATLAB, then you should, or you should at least tell it to compute some approximate uh, differences, but but uh, some finite differences, and you should not have it use some kind of uh, a black box method, which is typically very poor in, in performance. So it, it's always better to kind of provide the gradient. Um, but it also has, I mean, I think MATLAB has in it some LP solvers based on. I don't know either the simplex or path following methods, but uh, uh, these solvers are, are, I mean, they're good for, I mean, if your problem is not too large, they're very good. Uh, if you just want to kind of uh, push the limits of your linear program, I mean, if you have quite large linear programming and so on, uh, then you, you might consider using some of the more specialized solvers. Uh, like Groby is usually considered to be the fastest solver and so on. It, it depends really on, on your problem. Uh, um, so, okay. Uh, yes. Are there some questions related to methodologies introduced and presented by Professor Hamza? Yes, so um, methods that address uh, other methods mm -hmm. for different nonlinear problems. So there are ways to, so there's a question here about nonlinear problems. So um, I mean, one area, uh, I mean, so let's see how, um, so, so there are two ways to kind of think about nonlinear optimization or, or maybe I should say non-convex optimization problems really, uh, is one of them is just to use what we call nonlinear programming methods, which are, uh, methods that will look for a local minimum. Okay. So you, uh, um, so you run some kind of a Newton method or a, or a quasi-Newton method and, and you just solve kind of the first order, um, uh, the, the first order uh, optimality condition. So, uh, um, so uh, and there are very good packages to do this. So something like IP opt and so on, but these will not in general give you the global optimum. If uh, for, for people interested in doing global optimization, then the route usually to do this is to do what we call convex relaxations. And one very, uh, one, uh, one in fact active area of research is the use of semi-definite programming to formulate these convex relaxations. So there is a, a general way to, um, to write a convex relaxation uh, for nonlinear, so for example, polynomial optimization problems, which are in general are very, are very difficult. And uh, so, yeah, so these are based on semi-definite programming. The performance in general is quite good. 
even though the size of the semi-definite program is tend to be quite large. Okay, again, this is if you're interested in the in the global optimum. If you just want kind of a good enough solution, then you should just go with uh, with a, a nonlinear solver, something like uh, IP opt, for example. Okay, so I guess we can uh, uh, maybe stop here and, and uh, uh, resume for the last session this afternoon. So I was addressing. Uh, uh, yes, I think you sent me a message instead for of everybody. Mm -hmm. Request by mm -hmm. Iran. Yes, maybe there is a room to organize mm -hmm. uh, to organize a specific online course, a doctoral course related to practice, not to only to theory, but to yes. uh, let's say more more uh, practical aspects of, of experience in optimization. That yes. maybe that could help mm -hmm. uh, many of you. Uh, because optimization is a huge uh, forest. Yes. <laughs> and navigating inside is not easy. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Fauzi. Yeah, no problem. We, we scheduled the, your last uh, session. Uh, session this afternoon. Yes. Um, okay. Inshallah. Yes. So let Thank us uh, take a rest and then mm -hmm. we meet in this afternoon for the last presentation. Thank you very much, you. everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.